Um, so my name is Gordon Shotwell. I'm a, a software engineer on the Shiny team at Posit. Um, well, right, we just announced that Shiny for Python is out of alpha. It's available for everyone. The API is stable. Uh, Shiny for Python is um, uh, the Python version of our uh, popular R library for building interactive web app applications, mainly uh, focused on data science web applications. Uh, it's written 100% uh, in Python. There's no R code in the library. I think it sort of adds a lot of uh, power and flexibility to the uh, Python web application landscape. Uh, so Shiny for Python is being introduced because um, we saw a gap in the uh, Python web application uh, landscape. I really felt this um, in my own work when I was kind of trying to transition a lot of uh, Shiny for R apps to Python, and there wasn't really anything that I could find that did all the things that we needed the framework to do. And so Shiny for Python lets you kind of gives you a single framework that can handle a big range of complexity from very, very simple apps to very, very complicated ones. Um, without needing to learn a new thing or ch fundamentally change how you're developing the application. Um, so for the most part, uh, the popular kind of Python web application frameworks um, are really uh, narrowly focused on a single, I guess I could still call it range of complexity for an application. For example, Streamlit, it's really focused on that first you know, first experience of, of running a web application, moving from a, a script that you're writing on your computer to a initial web app. But what you end up, what you kind of discover as you work with it a little bit more is that the framework gets really, really difficult to use as your application gets much more complicated, which often causes people to maybe start developing something in Streamlit and then have to sort of stop and move to another framework or ask another group of people at their organization to develop um, like a quote unquote real web app. And Shiny takes a different approach, which is that it gives you a set of tools or a set of concepts that can accommodate a, a, a big range of, of different types of complexity. So it's something that you know you can teach a new person in an afternoon. You can spin up a tiny shiny app to test a like, statistical concept for yourself. Um, but it can also handle very very complicated applications, which normally you might need to use something like a JavaScript framework or Flask or Django um, to really accomplish. Um, so that's the the main thing it adds to the um, to the landscape is this ability to be sort of simple, but also know that you have the, they also give you the tools to accomplish really, really difficult tasks. The main strength of Shiny is uh, reactivity. And what that means is that the only things that re-render in a Shiny app are the things that need to re-render. So it doesn't run the application code top to bottom. It just uh, keeps track of the relationships between all the different inputs and outputs in your application uh, and re-renders the outputs which need to re-render if an input changes. What reactivity means is that when you're writing an application, um, you basically kind of decorate uh, various different um, function calls, which generate a relationship between all of those different function calls. So this ends up as a what's called a computation graph. And, what, and the main virtue of computational graphs is that you can minimally re-render them. So the application can do the smallest amount of work that it needs to do to generate the right output. What makes this very powerful for Shiny is that if you have, for example, like a multi-page app with many different components, the only components that actually like cause your computer to do anything are the ones that are visible to the to the user. So this kind of means that you can have like apps load fast initially, um, and then you can put sort of expensive computations in places that people don't necessarily go to right away to speed up the um, overall user experience. So reactivity um, serve, like creates is, hits this sweet spot where it allows you to accommodate really, really complex things, um, but your code doesn't really need to be that complicated because most of the work about the wiring and how, how, the, how those relationships um, are generated between um, the different components is really a side effect of writing the application. It's not something you need to think about that much, especially for a beginner. Um, Streamlit is a, a web application framework that allows you to take an existing Python script and add uh, special function calls that turn it into an uh, interactive web application. And the sort of main like virtue of Streamlit is that it's it's a really natural next step from developing a Python script. So the idea behind Streamlit is you take your existing Python script and just by adding some functions to that script, it turns it into a web application. So you don't need to reorganize your code very much initially to get something that 
that does run as a as a, a useful uh, interactive web application. So that initial experience is very good. Um, I mean, the app looks very nice um, right out of the right out of the gate. And the main thing is that for a brand new user, they're not asked to learn very much to start with Streamlit. And that's kind of, I think, one of the main reasons why it's been such a phenomenally successful company. Uh, the main technical difference between uh, Shiny and Streamlit is that Streamlit um, re-renders the whole application code start to finish every time any input changes. Um, whereas Shiny like only re-executes the parts of the application that need to be executed in order to um, display something. Uh, so this kind of comes up a lot of times when you maybe have a plot which is based on a reading in a big data set. If you change like some option that just affects like how the plot looks, like the color or the scales, um, by default Streamlit will just read in the whole application again. It'll start from the very beginning of the script and read the whole thing. Um, so there's various different ways of um, accommodating that on a Streamlit application and, and avoiding that problem of just reading and everything every, all, uh, all the time. Um, but all of them kind of add a lot of complexity to the application. So Streamlit apps, I would say, they start easy and end hard. So that as the, as the app grows in complexity, the things that you have to do to get it to work um, become really difficult and it stops being actually an easy experience. Um, Shiny takes a different approach, uh, which is that um, because it has this sort of reactive framework, um, the uh, you have to reorganize your code a little bit to get it to work initially. So that very, very first experience, um, you know, you have to learn a little bit to, to get there. But the lessons that you learn at the, at the beginning will carry you all the way through um, your application's journey, its life cycle. Um, so there's never a point once you kind of have a Shiny app running where the next ask, the next question becomes this like monumental task that requires you to refactor your application. Uh, so the way that it accomplishes that is by um, using by executing things in this computational in, in a computation graph instead of um, re-rendering everything whenever anything changes. Um, so there's a few uh, strengths of Shiny for Python. So one of them is um, Shiny applications are websites. So they're um, simple, like at the front end, it's a simple HTML site, which means that um, all of the sort of HTML or JavaScript knowledge that you or your team can bring to bear on the problem can be used right away. Um, similarly, if you have an existing like R app that has some CSS, that CSS should work, um, should be imported, could, should be importable without modification to your Shiny for Python app. Streamlit, by contrast, you know, they their way that they kind of run um, styling uh, means that it's much more difficult to add like truly customized user experiences on top of it. Um, it's kind of optimized for making the initial app look really good and have some some small changes that you can make. But if you really want to make a customized sort of look and feel of your application, it becomes pretty difficult. The second main thing is the compu is the relative computational efficiency of Shiny over Streamlit. So because Streamlit has made the choice to run everything start to finish, you kind of necessarily are going to have um, code which is running, which doesn't strictly speaking need to run in order to display the, the correct output for a given set of inputs. Shiny, by contrast, minimally re-renders components, which means that uh, you don't really need to think so hard about how your app is connected to itself, or making sure that only some, that the, only the right things are cached, Shiny handles all of that for you. Um, so with Streamlit, in order to build a kind of complicated app or app that reads in large data sets, um, you usually have to kind of manually manage callback functions or caching and caching validation, which can turn into a bit of a headache if you want to get a performant application. So of course, uh, all of these things, to some degree, are a matter of taste, like what people find difficult or not. But if you have experienced some of these uh, problems with Streamlit, you found that execution model limiting, or you found caching or callbacks confusing or fraught with bugs, I'd really encourage you to give uh, Shiny a try. Uh, we're a new framework in, in this world, but uh, we think we do have something really special to offer, and we'd uh, love your feedback on it. So Dash is a older, slightly older um, framework in the Python yeah, ecosystem, a web application framework that's built around this idea of uh, stateless functions, which means that each um, callback or each thing that's serving is creating a graph or a table is independent of all of the other uh, pieces. And its main goal, and, and it does, I think, a remarkably good job at accomplishing this goal, is to build um, applications which have, which are really, really efficient to deploy. Um, so I would say a lot of the 
things that Dash asks you to do as a developer are there so that the um, deployment of a Dash app and the way it's served by you know, servers to, to the user um, is, is really, really efficient. Um, and that's kind of the main, main thing that it optimizes for. The value of that is that it's easy to scale apps horizontally by adding a lot of more servers, a lot more processes, and you know because you have these kind of independent callbacks. When you have done the work to develop a, a good Dash app, you've gone through that process, the app that you end up with um, is really, really efficient to serve to users. Um, so the kind of user experience is fast, and more, most importantly, the um, process of scaling that app um, is really, really easy for a, for a DevOps uh, person. Um, so uh, stateful versus stateless. So stateful apps are apps that have that where the server is kind of maintaining uh, some information about the user session. Mostly when you're working on a script on your computer, you have some kind of global variable or uh, information that is passed that is held in memory on your computer and passed to a bunch of different functions. So in stateful applications, you have the, that information is held in memory by the server and is passed to the individual uh, function calls. Stateless applications take a different approach, which is that there's no nothing. The server is not maintaining any kind of state about the user. Like each component of the app kind of needs to go from start to finish to deliver that particular graph. So if you have three graphs or three different components being rendered on a website, in the stateless framework, um, they might each read in a data set, each read in the same data set in order to generate that uh, component. And the, the the value of that is that you can um, is that multi-threading becomes really, really easy because you don't need to keep any of those components in sync. You could have one application, one session, user session be served by three or 15 different servers. They can be served by servers in different countries and it doesn't really matter. The issue with developing um, stateless applications is that it's not how you usually program. So if you're programming on your computer, you usually are dealing with one process on one laptop, one computer. And um, as a result, it's really natural to use um, variables to store information in, in server state um, and to have uh, functions you know, read data, data in in one place and have it be used in many places by rendering functions. And so when you're moving from that sort of stateful way that you've been developing a project to a stateless Dash application, it can be really painful. Um, and you end up needing to do quite a lot of work to move your your process into that world in a kind of reasonably efficient way. When you compare Shiny to Dash, the main thing that Shiny has is just a richer set of server states. So Shiny is stateful, and what that means is that you can have uh, you can read data in in one place. You can have um, reactive calculation that does some work on it, and then pass that the result of that reactive calculation to as many different rendering functions as you want. So it, it really does a better job of respecting the kind of do not repeat yourself principle of computer programming, where you're um, reading in the data in one place, you're processing it in another function, and passing it to rendering functions only afterwards. With Dash, uh, you kind of are, are forced, if you have like an application with three graphs, you have a couple of choices that you can make. You can have three functions which each read, read and process the data, uh, or you can have one sort of mega function that reads in the data and then updates all three plots. And I, I, both of them are kind of a little awkward because you're that's not usually how you're used to developing um, applications. Usually what you want to do is have each function do one thing and do it well, and you want to have each calculation happen in one place. You don't want to have that code be repeated anywhere in your application. And when you're moving to Dash, you kind of uh, have to pick between a few options, none, none of which are terribly appealing. Uh, so whenever I've developed a web application, um, usually I need to start developing it very, very quickly. Like I have almost no time to get a minimal thing out the door. Um, but it never stays simple. It always gets more complicated. There's another ask, there's another um, requirement from some user, and the application slowly becomes more complicated. It's used by more people, more people want more things from it. Um, so our design philosophy for Shiny is that we want Shiny to support any of those asks. So even though it's something that you can start, get something up in an afternoon um, or a couple of hours, you know that you have all the tools to make it business critical web application that's used by many, many people. And you don't. we don't want you to end up in a place where there's some task, something you really want this application to do, and the framework just won't let you do it. Um, so we start, we, that's, that's kind of what we mean when we say that it strikes a, a great balance between simplicity and complexity. It's It starts simple, but that application can handle 
uh, can grow to be to accomplish really, really complicated problems without needing to sort of fight the framework. Uh, to sum up, most of the other most of the popular Python web application frameworks are focused on a kind of narrow band of problem complexity. Uh, Streamlit is focused on you know, your initial application just right when you start. Dash is focused on applications which are where, where uh, deployment efficiency is really, really important. Um, and there's not really a single framework that lets you grow from uh, very, very simple problems to very, very complicated ones. The killer feature of Shiny is that it does support that type of, of complexity. So it's a simple set of principles to learn about building your initial Shiny app. But once you learn them, you don't really need to change them as your problem gets more complicated. It supports um, a full range of CSS and JavaScript customization, and also um, has an execution model that's efficient enough to handle data science web applications, which can often be quite um, computationally intensive. Our main hope is that uh, you all try this framework, let us know what works and what doesn't, um, show us what you're building with it, and help us develop some of the community contributions um, that we really need to make this uh, a successful project. So um, give it a try, and we can't uh, wait to see what you build with it. Mm -hmm.